doctors and scientists are crazy. The road to modern medicine has not been a smooth one. We've learned the hard way that slicing people's frontal lobes with ice picks and blowing tobacco smoke up people's anuses does more harm than good. But despite all the quackery, some of the oldest ideas in medical history are still used today in healthcare. Maybe in a few decades, we'll look back at ourselves and shake our heads. I mean, take chemotherapy for example. It's evolved from a chemical warfare agent to a life-saving drug that often makes someone feel worse before making them better. But for now, here are five of the weirdest treatments in human history that still have a place in modern medicine. I'm going to warn you now, some of these will make you squirm. All right, cast yourself back 7,000 years. It was around this time that one of the oldest and most widespread surgical procedures known to man was starting to emerge, trepanation. The act of drilling, cutting, and scraping holes into people's skulls. Now, back when I was a medical student many moons ago, to avoid fainting in the cadaver labs, we medical students were advised to hydrate and have something to eat before the session. Now, this is gonna be a gory one, so I advise you to do the same. And while you're at it, make sure you drop a subscribe and like as well. Trepanation was so popular that of all the skulls that have been dug up from the late Neolithic period, five to 10% of them have had holes in them. That's more than the percentage of people on earth using Twitter today. Some of these historic head holes even show signs of healing. So despite the total lack of antibiotics, anesthetics, and general hygiene at the time, it looks like people might have actually survived the surgery. Higher brain function, however, was not guaranteed. Now, trepanation was mainly used to treat head injuries, migraines, epilepsy, and mental health, with the hole serving to either relieve cranial pressure or to allow trapped demons to escape from the confines of a sufferer's skull, because science. After the Middle Ages, trepanation began to fall out of favor, but since the 1960s, it's been making a bit of a comeback. Its proponents claim the procedure increases flexible thinking and induces a permanent high. I mean, who needs psychedelic drugs when you can just drill a hole through your head, right? Okay, but seriously, do not try this at home. I won't be held responsible. Trepanation doesn't just exist in the realms of hippies and healers, we actually give it a name. These skull holes are often used in hospitals to treat skull fractures, to access and remove brain tumors, and to drain blood and other fluids that can build up around the brain after a head injury. Burr holes, these are small holes that are used to drain excess fluids and relieve pressure on the brain, while craniotomies involve the removal of a larger part of the skull to allow access to the brain. Now jumping forward a couple of millennia to ancient Egypt, another classic cure-all was beginning to make a splash. Bloodletting. Literally draining people's blood until they passed out. Okay, but why? Well, back in the day, bloodletting was thought to rid the body of impure fluids. Around 400 BC, a Greek physician called Hippocrates came up with this theory that the body contained four humors or liquids, black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. These humors needed to be kept in a state of perfect balance to maintain good health. Bloodletting was a way of restoring the balance of these fluids if they somehow got out of whack. So it got so popular in medieval Europe that you could have your blood drained at your local barbers after getting your hair trimmed. I mean, they probably use the same blade too. If you've ever wondered why barber shops have these weird candy cane poles outside, well now you know. The red represented the let blood, while the white symbolized the bandages that would be wrapped around the wound after you'd finished dripping. Nothing sweet about these candy canes. You'll never see them the same way again. Physicians eventually switched from the lancet to the leech in the 18th century because it was less painful and less messy. They got so popular actually that in the 1830s, hospitals in Paris alone got through five to six million leeches a year. You might think that leech therapy is a thing of the past, but you would be wrong. Today, they're mainly used to treat blocked veins after reconstructive surgery. More severe bloodletting is also still used occasionally to treat certain blood disorders like hemochromatosis that lead to the dangerous buildup of iron in important organs. 
All right, all right. What if I told you with 70% accuracy, you could find out whether you are pregnant or not by pissing on a seed? Well, yeah, you can. First documented in 1400 BC, women in ancient Egypt were told to pee in two different bags, one containing barley seeds and the other filled with wheat. If any of these seeds sprouted, chances are the woman was pregnant. The Egyptians went on to say that if the barley sprouted first, you'd have a boy. But if the wheat sprouted first, you'd have a girl. All right, so that bit was a little bit less accurate, but they were definitely onto something with the peeing part. When you're pregnant, your urine contains a different hormonal cocktail compared to the urine of people who aren't pregnant. One of these hormones was probably what caused the seeds to sprout. So there really is some science behind peeing on seeds. And in the 16th century in Europe, piss prophets used a similar trick to tell if a woman was pregnant. Yes, I said piss prophets. That's really what they were called. But instead of pissing on seeds, Seeds, they'd mix the urine with wine. The alcohol probably reacted with the pregnancy related proteins in the urine, causing a change in the consistency. Just don't drink that stuff. And modern pregnancy tests are basically a present day plastic piss profit. These tests look for the presence of a hormone called human chorionic gonadotrophin or HCG, which pulls the brakes on the body's normal menstrual cycle and prepares it for pregnancy. Special antibodies have been engineered to bind with this hormone and the binding triggers a color change reaction, which shows up as that little blue line on the test window. I mean, if you really wanted, you could still go and pee on some barley, but the piss sticks gonna be a lot quicker and more accurate and you wouldn't incur the wrath of the local farmer. Okay, so serious question. How long do you think we've been performing plastic surgery? 20 years, maybe a hundred years, no. Believe it or not, nose jobs date back to 600 BC, about the same time as they were founding the Roman Empire. The first rhinoplasty, aka nose job, was actually documented by an ancient Indian physician and surgeon called Sushruta, who's recognized today as the granddaddy of plastic surgery. So we have him to thank for all our unrealistic body expectations. Thanks. But the difference is, in ancient India, the reason people had no jobs was for a crazy reason. So they were less concerned about getting a perfectly straight schnoz or a big nose or a small nose. They were just more concerned about having a nose in the first place. Back then, it wasn't unusual for petty criminals and war prisoners to have their noses cut off as a form of punishment because why not? Listen. No one wants to walk around with a giant hole where their nose should be. So Shoshrita suggested cutting a flap of skin from the forehead, folding it down over the missing muzzle. This flap of skin was kept intact so as to maintain the blood supply to the grafted skin, which could then be sculpted into the shape of a nose. And yeah, we still do exactly that. All right, this last one is the worst one. So I'm glad you're still watching. Back in the fourth century, a potent concoction called golden juice or yellow soup, but we'll name it forbidden soup and you'll know why. This was administered by Chinese healers as a treatment for severe food poisoning and diarrhea. And the main ingredient, dried up poo. But believe it or not, we're still dishing out poop prescriptions today. We've given it a rebrand calling it fecal microbial transplantation. It sounds a lot better and a lot more sciencey. And we usually administer it at the other end. I mean, it's still poop, usually somebody else's. The theory behind it centers on the trillions of bacteria and other microbes that live in our guts, collectively known as the gut microbiome that help us with digestion and support our immune system. Not all bacteria are good, granted, but most of the time there are enough friendly ones to outcompete the bad guys. But after a course of antibiotics, the bad bacteria can start to take over. When this happens, a poo transplant from a healthy volunteer is sometimes the best way of repopulating the patient's gut microbiome with a diverse and healthy range of microbes. Currently, poo transplants are only really used to treat patients who've been infected by antibiotic resistant Clostridium difficile, an intestinal bacterium that can infect the bowels and cause diarrhea. But as we learn more about the microbiome, poo transplants might become the medical magic bullet we've all been waiting for or not been waiting for.